Hello, and welcome to the Blockchain Journal Club. I'm Carlos. And I'm Perry. Hello, Perry. How's it going? Good, how are you? Not bad, not bad. Growing out the beard. You got the beard going. I'm, I'm used yeah. to it now. I like it. Nice, thanks. Hair, hair check, woo. Does it just keep going up? It, like it, it just is always perpendicular to your to the tangent. I want a straight afro, like a non curly haired afro, you know, just like a like lines going up, you know, but huge. I don't know anyone with hair that thick that you like see my never beard falls. Hair. My beard hair is ridiculously thick. It's disgusting, actually. It's it's like those uh, metal sponges, you know, those metal like. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see the the, the scrapey ones. Yeah, yeah. But your beard curls in. Yes. Your hair just goes straight up into infinity. That's true. That's true. Very impressive. Congratulations. <laughs> I think um, I'm, I'm really, the only thing I miss from the old world is uh, hair salons. My beard. Haircuts. That's all I miss. You can just, uh, you can cut your own hair. Can't. Can't do it. It's too specific. I can't do a fade. Your hair hasn't grown in like uh, in three months, so it's, it's, you're fine. I, on the other hand... Yeah, Jesus. My hair is. For those of you listening, I'm <laughs> currently like, I'm seeing a sphere with lines sticking out of it. Um, okay. Um, how are you doing? Otherwise, you submitted your thesis. Submitted. Ready how do you to feel? How do you feel? I feel I'm still, you know, kind of nervous. You know, I got to go through nervous? the fence. Oh, come on. Get out of here. Okay. Can't wait for yours when you'll be nervous. I, w- I will be nervous. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so I should have just lied. But I think you're gonna have you're gonna have three journal uh, articles in your thesis. Yes. Like there's nothing they can say to that's like yes you published three papers. What Next. if I don't know? What if I don't know anything? Uh, do you think it matters? I don't know. I've never seen a physics defense, but I mean the ones I've been to in CS are pretty like easy. <laughs> It's just like, a, it's like a, I think it's like three hours. It's, it's just like time for three hours. What? Yeah. You give a 20 minute talk and then they ask like, what, two or three rounds of questions? Yeah, I guess it can go on. Two rounds, 20 minutes each person, yeah, yeah. each round. But I feel like physicists are a little bit uh, like annoying with their questions. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find out in a couple of months. You know, I try to explain Bitcoin to your lab and it's like uh, a freaking. Uh, I don't know. It was Six okay. hour. Yeah, I mean it's good, but there's just like, can we move on? <laughs> just accept it. Yes, it's two hundred fifty six bits. That's it. That's just what it is. Make your own Bitcoin with two hundred fifty five. <laughs> I think you want to have bytes though, so it has to be a multiple of eight. Of course, yeah. Um, or two to the or yeah eight. You know, I thought of something the other day, and I had an interesting discussion about it. I thought it'd be fun to bring it up not really a a blockchain thing, but in my mind, Elon Musk was like, is up there with Warren, not Warren, um, you know, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, like top, top CEO, like innovator guy, you know? Okay. Then I realized he isn't. (laughs) So I I mean, I, I think Tesla's very impressive, but he's not doing anything that's changing the world at all, you know? um, He's a one to end. He's not a zero to one is my point. And I discussed this with some other friends and they were like, at this, it's like I was saying something insane, you know? One sec though, it's, he, he, he is innovating, right? I think he's on the forefront of self-driving cars. He's like making these... Uh... He's, en- he's basically engineering. He's a very good engineer, I guess. But it's more than that, right? He also discovered how, like, how to make these electric motors that work better than all the other motors, right? Or whatever. Sure, sure. But that's that's like not a new concept that he's introducing, you know, he's just optimizing something that we've been trying to optimize for a long time. No, it's new, right? It's not just a very efficient gasoline motor. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an electric motor. Sure. But there, there, there have been electric cars for a long time. Like there was a Prius, like he just, I mean, I think what, what was innovative about Tesla was like, he made electric cars sexy and like cool. And that's also more perform- a marketing thing. Also performant. Like, and they had a very good, like top notch engineering for sure. Yeah. Good AI. But it's not like uh, I, I, the world is the same. There's just cars that work on electricity now. Well, you know, yeah. he's working on going to Mars, I guess. Still, I don't know. It, it seems like his uh, his goals are very like science fiction goals, you know? Mm. It's obvious but, stuff. 
I, I had another discussion with someone else and they were, they were just like, but Elon Musk doesn't do anything. You know, he just like hires people to like engineer yeah. stuff for him. He just has yeah. like, he just comes up with a very obvious idea. Like, mm-hmm. let's make a super good car. And they're like, okay, let's just hire a bunch of people. To, to for sure. I mean, I guess he must be really good at like getting money and like investing. He probably like so that's the thing. a huge amount of debt, you know? When, when I think when that. he got, when he started Tesla, it was like a, a bunch of people were trying to get these like uh, grants to make things like uh, environmentally friendly. Mm-hmm. And nothing worked except his thing that came out of that, you know? Okay. Like, cool. all, all the companies that started, like got those grants, like none of them actually did anything except his Sure. Yeah. I mean, he executes very well. Yeah, absolutely. But I read also that he, I, I, I think that cause he started PayPal, I guess. Right. I don't know if he started it, but he was in there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think PayPal claims that they, uh, they were the first like peer to peer decentralized no. thing. I think so. Crazy. I think that's a thing. That's the other thing I was thinking about, you know, like is Tesla or Elon Musk, you know, a game changer, like Bitcoin, you know, like that from zero to like now that we have this thing that people didn't look, even know they wanted, you know, but Bitcoin, like is, iPads. but Bitcoin is just a very efficient bank if you want or whatever, you know, or it's like, it's not changing. Like there was a bank before now it's a decentralized bank or whatever. I mean, yes, I, I guess there's like some, there's always con- continuity with yeah, the world. So but I think it, it's like there was cars, he made a new car, but it's just like a new thing, you know, it's like an electric car that works better than everything else. But it's not a new concept is my issue. Like, you know, you, you could have spent your life making the telephone super good and it's still going to be a telephone that like solves the problem of making phone calls. But then you get the, you know, the iPhone, which has like a completely different concept that you have to explain to someone, you know? Yeah, but, he's, but it's a self-driving stuff also, right? But that Google was doing that way before, you know? But is Google doing it still? I, don't, I think Google stopped it. Maybe, I don't know, but maybe, maybe he's just successful at it, you know? Yeah, he is. I'm just saying uh, in, in my book now, a few notches down in terms of like, you know, uh, technical social innovation. I, st- I still think they're doing a great job. Please so hire me, Tesla. So you're selling your Tesla stuff though? I mean, I sold some of it. I, I, not because I don't think they're a good company, obviously. Um, but my point is like, I don't know, companies like Google, I think really changed the world, you know? Mm-hmm. But if Tesla accomplishes all of its goals, the world is, is the same. It's just, you drive your car, it drives itself, whatever. Um, I don't know. No, but less accidents, less. Uh, yeah, less, yeah. less, less. It's not something else that you have to optimize over now. You know, everything like now, is, everything no, but is phone apps, less. you know, like phone apps are a, a, a thing that was not on anyone's radar, you know? Sure, it's it, just like taking a video game console or whatever, and putting it on a phone, taking a phone book and putting it on the phone. It's like, or miniaturizing a computer. It's yeah, all the same. Computer. Sure. I, yes, things are continuous. I agree. But I feel like it was just really something that you had to just throw a lot of engineering and money at in order for it to work. And that's Maybe. It. it didn't seem to like need, need like a big idea. That's all. He's also that's, going to Mars. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Maybe he'll cultivate Mars or something. <laughs> yeah. Solve anyway, the... I was just like, I, I, I was watching his like stance on, on the coronavirus stuff. And I was thinking, you know, like, who is this guy even? What does he think he is? <laughs> he went on Joe Rogan. All he was saying, all he was saying, was like, oh, "I think like uh, the actual mortality rate is a few orders of magnitude less than what we think it is." Ah, That's well, Musk. There you go. Let's uh, new, <clears throat> go right. back on track. Yeah, maybe because I think this is a long. It's a long. It's gonna be a long discussion potentially. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, maybe we don't have to go like super in depth, but um, I guess the concept overall is is not something super involved but there's a lot of detail yeah so today i guess we're going to talk about wallets Mm -hmm. um and this is brought up go ahead i just wanted to say this is the blockchain journal club i see and uh, i'm just going to say you know what the concept is if anyone listened to our 20 minute past our 20 minute discussion of elon musk um we're gonna do we do a weekly podcast where we discuss a paper i guess in this case it's um a textbook chapter uh, about blockchain um, technology. We want to summarize the concepts, discuss it a little bit, and um, learn as much as we can. So without further ado, go for it, Perry. Yeah, so maybe actually before we start. So this is, uh, we're going back to wallets now. Last week we did uh, applications. Yeah. This week we're back to wallets. 
I guess we're going to try to structure this. Maybe maybe we should try to structure this. I think from now on, maybe we, we do the better. wallets. Oh, we still have to release the episode with uh, Jacob. So I, I actually, I think I'm going to release that this week. And okay. then we do wallets. Then when then we do a few more of applications. <laughs> okay. Maybe that should be the schedule. Yeah. Okay. So we'll try to organize things a bit better from now on, but we're going back to wallets. And this was brought upon, I guess, because last time or two weeks ago, maybe we discussed uh, brain wallets and how they are insecure or there was some vulnerabilities with these brain wallets. But now we're going to talk about um, a more secure version of wallets and how Bitcoin wallets uh, are meant to work, I guess. So this, th this, what we're going to follow for this discussion is chapter five of the Bitcoin book written primarily, I guess, by Andreas Antonopoulos and non-primarily by me. Boom. Can we see your commit? Do you have it? Uh, how do we look at that? Um, I'd have to go on your, I'd have to go on your GitHub. Anyway, let's not waste time on that. The <laughs> yeah, point yeah. is, uh, Perry, you, you, uh, contributed to this book. Yeah. I could fix some typos, you know, every, oh, every multiple typos. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Insane. Every bit counts. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Um, so I guess, uh, people aren't familiar with GitHub. Um, it's a collaborative coding platform. So this book technically is on GitHub and anybody can contribute to it. And Perry found some typos, which he uh, proposed as improvements and they were accepted. And now the book is better. Thanks to Perry. There you go. Anybody, anybody can try to make it better if they have a good idea. There you go. All right. Yep. Go for it. Yeah. So um, I guess we'll start with, there are, there are two, I guess, broad types of wallets. Um, there are these wallets. I'll just go through the pictures, right? So they're not. But we should say wallets. what a wallet is first, no? We can say what a wallet. Yeah. So for those who don't know, a wallet is basically uh, say it's 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 an app or a device that manages your private keys. And what does that mean to manage your private keys? It means if you ever want to spend a tra spend some Bitcoin, uh, it contains the private keys that correspond to the public keys that can spend the Bitcoin you want to spend. Right, so it doesn't actually contain any Bitcoin. It just contains keys that unlock certain Bitcoin on the blockchain. Could you say that a wallet is a set of keys or that it's actually like the set of keys plus like the, the set of functions to use them? Hmm. Um, I guess I maybe think, it's just a set of keys, right? Well, from this, it's a set of keys, right? If you look at yeah. this figure one, these are non-deterministic wallets and they're just basically a bunch of keys, right? Mm -hmm. So here you have, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight distinct keys that are related to eight distinct public keys. So, so these are private keys related to eight distinct public keys. And so this wallet say could spend all the Bitcoin uh, sent to any of those eight public keys. Mm -hmm. So usually I guess to say that a wallet contains keys means at least that it's some kind of encrypted folder, right? Like the minimum thing a wallet can be is a folder with keys in it and it's encrypted. Otherwise, it's well, just a set of keys. I mean, they need to be contained somehow, no, I guess? Yeah, I guess. I mean, they probably, they probably provide a very concrete definition. Wallet so, is used to describe a few different things. Oh, okay, okay that's my problem. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so it's a problem with user interface. The wallet controls access to the user's money, managing mm -hmm. keys and addresses, tracking the balance, and creating the sign, signing transactions. So yeah, maybe you're right. So. It just doesn't, no, but it, doesn't it says that right after that, it says uh, for programmers, a wallet is just a set of keys. Sure. But I mean, for yeah. everybody else, maybe using yeah. these, it also allows you to sign transactions, right? Cool. It lets you use the pub private key. You don't have to do your, you don't have to code anything yourself to sign a mm -hmm. transaction and send it over the blockchain. The, the, maybe the wallet manages this for you. So the first is this type zero non-deterministic random wallet, what they call. And it's just a collection of randomly generated keys. So you just generate a bunch of private keys from those keys. So these random private keys are just random numbers. Then you can do this ellipt ellipt elliptic key cryptography and get generate the public keys from the private keys. And this wallet can manage all that stuff for you. Okay, and that's maybe a bit uh, difficult to manage because now you have to remember all these private keys, right? So each private key is distinct. Uh, if ever you wanna import your wallet to some other device, you'd have to import all these private keys. It can get a bit annoying. So there's an alternative 
which is called a deterministic wallet. And this type one deterministic wallet, which is the simplest deterministic wallet. Um, basically what you do is you get a seed. So you generate some random number and then you can hash that random number. And that gives you an, a new random number. That could be your first private key. And then you can hash that private key and get another random number called K1. That could be your second private key. And you can keep doing that forever. So basically if you ever wanted to import this into some other, de other device, you would just need the seed because the hash function is known. So you can regenerate all your private keys just from one seed. Okay, so that's the, that's the a deterministic wallet in its simplest form. Maybe um, we can just say like, why would you want to have mo more than one private key? Yeah, so I think that's... Uh, Maybe that comes up later, no? That gives some examples of like managing a store and something like that. Yeah, but we can, we can briefly say that, you know, the, just like you wouldn't want to keep all your money in one spot, maybe all under your mattress. You know, if you might want to keep it in different places. You mm -hmm. give the example also of, you know, maybe uh, someone puts a gun to your head, say, and says, give me your Bitcoin. If you had two private keys, maybe you give them the private key to the address that has less money to satisfy him. Mm -hmm. Or her. Or her, yes. Um, so, yeah, that's the point, I guess. Um, but now there's these other type of private keys, these um, actually, yeah, sorry, my scrolling is very bad because I'm scrolling on your computer, Carlos, but. Do you need a hand? Sorry? Do you need a hand? Uh, I think we're good now. So these HD private, these HD wallets, right? Which HD stands for again? Do you remember what it stands for? I don't. Well, deterministic, I guess, is the one of them. Yes. Highly deterministic. Um, yeah, I don't know what the HD was for. I can't remember. Damn. You can find it. Yeah, I'm scanning. Hi hierarchical. There you go. Ah, uh, yes. So uh, in this, in this, these hierarchical deterministic um, wallets. Again, you start with a seed. So deterministic means you start with a seed and you can generate everything else. Deterministically. Yes. You only need this seed and you can import this wallet into any device you want. Uh, but here now you can generate a master key and from that master key, you can create multiple different keys. And then each one of these different child keys are related to grandchildren keys independently of all the other children. So it's a, a, a tree like structure instead of like this linear structure of mm -hmm. this type one deterministic uh, wallet. Um, okay. So these are the three types of, um, Okay, and I guess they talk about the advantages right here. I don't know if you could see the cursor, mm -hmm. but uh, so there's two major advantages. Um, so, you, you know, one is the tree structure lets you organize things the way you want. So maybe you say like, uh, the, all the children of child zero are my uh, groceries, you know? And then like, depending on the grocery store you go to, you have different sub wallets for that. And then the child, all the children of, uh, all the grandchildren from child to one instead of zero are all the are all my uh, investments or I don't know. So you can organize your your spending or and your wallets uh, using this tree-like structure. And the second is the thing I talked about before, where I guess um, sorry. So yeah, you you could okay. Now I didn't talk about this before, but you can also set this up so that it's receiver only. So basically, you can generate public keys without knowing private keys using a structure like this, which we'll get to a little bit later. Okay, so, so cool. So you can, the public keys do not need to be preloaded or de uh, derived in advance. The server doesn't have access to any private keys, but it can generate new public keys. So you can set this up on some third party server so that it can generate a bunch of public keys for you without knowing any of the private keys. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's, those are the, the, the basic types of wallets. Uh, and now the chapter goes into um, how wallets, I guess, are encoded or how private keys are encoded. So uh, the way this works is you have a seed. So here it's given in hex. So hexadecimal means you have numbers zero to nine and letters A to F. So it's a base 16 counting system, right? So A means uh, 10, uh, F means 15, and then you have everything in between. Um, okay, and then, uh, 
Yeah, okay. So you can also, from, from this, this seed, this deterministic, or this, uh, this, this seed, you can generate words that correspond to each one of these uh, seeds, right? So in this case, the seed is this list of words, and they describe how you get these list of words from that seed a bit later. Um, maybe I'll just skip to that part right now. Sorry, the scrolling is very slow. I think you passed it, no? Did I? Do you want the table of words? Like, uh... Uh, no, I wanted this actually. Oh, okay. So, so th this is how you generate the wallet. I mean, we can go through the table of words, but I think it's just, you, we can just go from here right away. But I guess we should say you passed like a little alert box, this one, right? Mnemonic words are often confused with brain wallets, which we talked about already. Yeah. So maybe you can just, you can tell us, Carlos, while I organize my notes, um, why that is not the case. Yeah, so I, I guess we'll go into it. But the point is, uh, in order to start off um, the wallet generation process, you need some source of randomness. So you can either actually, uh, and essentially the, the, that randomness becomes your key, in a sense. And you can either pick that randomly, so you get something that looks like gibberish, or you start off with a word that you decide, like, you know, hello. And that could be your seed. And And if someone, that makes it so that, you're essentially not generally random, randomly generating um, a seed. And then people can probably try to guess that someone else may have come up with that kind of seed and derive all your keys and all your wallets, all your keys from it. So that's why um, a, a brain wallet is essentially a, a seed that you pick. And a mnemonic is just a way to represent a seed um, that was possibly randomly generated in as a list of uh, English words. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, you know, the, well, okay, maybe I'll just go through the process and we'll discuss the list of words as we go. So let's say I wanted to create a wallet. The way this works is I create a random sequence. So they call this entropy, so because it's random. So I can create a random sequence of 128 to 256 bits. Okay, so these are 256, a sequence of 256 randomly distributed zeros and ones. Um, and then I take the hash of that to create a checksum. A checksum, all it does is I take the hash of this and puts a certain amount of that hash. I append it to the end of the randomness so that I know that I can make a mistake because if I hash the first uh, 256 bits and I compare it to the checksum, I should always get the same thing for the checksum mm -hmm. right? because the hash is deterministic, right? So I add the checksum to the end of the random sequence and then I split the result into 11 bit length segments. So what does that mean? I cut my 256 bits plus this checksum into 11, uh, I divide into, uh, into strings of 11 bits. Okay, you can scroll all the way down. I can read this from here. Uh, and then there's a dictionary of 2,048 words, which is just two to the 11, uh, which associates uh, 11 bits to a word, right? So for example, the 11 bits Zero, 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 like 11 zeros in a row is, is uh, associated to the word ab abandon. 10 zeros in a row with a one is associated to ability. And you can do this for all uh, 2048 possible 11 bit strings. And that's how you generate your mnemonic, right? So you've encoded now uh, your, well, in, in this example, 128 bits into uh, a list of words that are English, like 12 English words that are maybe easier to remember. But these 12 English words are also just random, right? They're, 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 you haven't reduced the randomness in your initial 128 bits, 128 bit private key. They're also easier to like uh, enter to input, you know? Yeah, transcribe, input yeah. into new wallets and all this stuff, yeah. So if you just go through it, maybe I'll just go through it one more time. So you generate 128 bits randomly, you hash that, you take the first four bits of the hash, add it to the end of the 120 bits, uh, the 128 random bits. So you have something now that's uh, 132 bits. If you divide that into uh, 11 bit strings, you get 12 segments. You map the 12 segments to the word. And then at the end, you've encoded your uh, 128 bits into 12 words that are English. Easier to input into new devices, easier to manage, easy, you can tattoo them on your body maybe. So you always have a copy. Okay, so that's how you get, um, okay, and then depending on how much randomness you want, you can generate a different length 
uh, the checksum changes, right? Because it needs to be divisible by 11 always. Mm -hmm. So this table tells you how many uh, uh, bits from the hash you need so that the checksum uh, from the ch uh, to form the checksum, right? So if you want 256 bits of entropy in the beginning, you have to add eight bits from the checksum to get a 264 bit, uh, uh, well, 264 bits to get 24 words from the mnemonic. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? And Trezor, Trezor uses 24 words, right? I think so there's I think an option. Has, uh, 256 I bits of entropy. Isn't there an option? I think there's an option. It's maybe. true. I think, I think uh, when you did it recently, it was 24, but I, I, I seem to remember, recall that it was, had been 12 for a while. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe yeah I, I think, I think you can, you can, uh, you can change that. Hmm. Okay. So now uh, we've, we've generated a mnemonic, which is just, um, we haven't generated our seed yet, like our, our, our seed to create the private keys and stuff. So that's um, in this next section. Uh, so the way that works is you take your 12 words. Oops. I'm sorry about this. Cost. maybe I'll, I'll stop scrolling and you scroll to the you section. You want the figure, right? Yeah, or even the table, uh, the list above. Okay. There. Oh, seven, eight, nine? Yeah. Okay, so I'll get the table and so the figure. The, the, the next thing we want to do is take our mnemonic code words, add a salt, which is just some passphrase if you want, and then input them into this uh, key stretching function to create a 512-bit a, a, a seed. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and then this seed... Uh, uh, yeah, so this seed is going to let us create, this is, this is going to be the seed for a hierarchical uh, deterministic wallet, right? So all we've done so far is nothing but generate the mnemonic code words that will go in to getting our 512-bit seed. Now, and this seed will allow us to generate uh, all the wallets uh, in, the, in the hierarchical structure. Okay? And so the way this works is you take your mnemonic words, you add a salt, which is just a, a string of characters. Uh, for the, in, the, in, this, in this implementation, this string of characters is the word mnemonic plus any passphrase you want. Right? So you, you add these together. Um, if you put no passphrase, because it's optional, it, it just uses the word mnemonic. mnemonic. Uh, you apply this key stretching function, which is just this HMAC SHA-512 function you apply that function 500, uh, 2,048 times and you output a 512-bit seed. What does it mean to apply it 2,048 times? Like you take the output, put it back as input and That's right. uh, re repeat? Okay. That's right. And the reason they do that is listed right here is because if someone's trying to guess your seed, mm -hmm. everything is multiplied by 2,048. Like they have to, for yeah. one guess, they have to do things 2,048 times. For sure. So it's, it's very difficult to brute force this. And the stretching um, actually like increases the the output space. Yes, but I don't think that matters, right? Because it's 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 a one to one. It's a deterministic, right? The hash, the hash function. Yes, but I mean, it, it actually makes the like if you're trying to reverse the process, it makes it harder as well, right? I think reversing the process is always going to be exponential in, or whatever. You, you, you have to brute force. Yeah. But the brute force is much harder now because uh, for every input try, you have to do it 2,048 times. Yeah. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. So maybe I'll let you scroll down. Uh, well, I guess we can say like um, that this mnemonic, like what's uh, cool or could be useful about having the extra salt thing there. Yeah, so if you, if you go down to the next section, they give the examples, right? Mm -hmm. oh, now I'm doing your job of scrolling. Sorry. But in this example, for, uh, okay, in this example uh, okay, these are two different examples, say table three and table four. You start off with this 128-bit uh, uh, entropy input, say. Random. Random input, yeah. You get these 12 words that we discussed before. So army, van, defense, blah, blah, blah. And you put no passphrase. The 512-bit seed that's output from the process we just described is this, this string. But now I can use the same uh, randomness, 128 bits of randomness, 
and use the passphrase super duper secret and I get a different string. So if I wanted to, I could encode one wallet with no passphrase and a different hierarchical wallet with a passphrase super duper secret. And again, I can do this trick where if someone wants my money, I can put some money in the, in the wallets that have um, no passphrase and more money in the, pass, in the wallets that have some super duper secret passphrase and I can split my money that way. So no one can steal all my money. It also uh, protects you from hacking, right? Like if someone were to hack your hardware that stores your words, uh, your mnemonic, yes. right? Yeah, if the hardware doesn't store your passphrase. Sure. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Which they say, I think, in the text, you know, like, don't store your passphrase, your mnemonic with your, sorry, yeah. don't store your salt with your rest of your words because it defeats the entire purpose. Yeah, so I know that, so when you, when you, when you, when you initialize a treasure, the, the words that they ask you to write down are just these words mm -hmm. here, these mnemonic words. Yeah. And then it just generates all the street, it generates a bunch of wallets hierarchically from those words. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to implement this passphrase in the treasure, but I'm sure there must be a way. They do. I mean, that's what they offer as a solution to the fact that they were, that someone hacked the treasure, right? Yeah, but I haven't gone through, uh, I don't know how they, I don't know how you did that. They just tell you to do exactly this. Okay. So just like remember your passphrase, and then if someone hacks your your treasure. Oh no no! But I mean, how do you imp how do you put in the passphrase oh. in the treasure? Oh, I think it's just an option. Like there's okay. a setting. Yeah. So there, there there is an option somewhere to do yeah. this. So hopefully now, just to summarize, uh, to get a hierarchical wallet, you start from randomness, maybe 120 bits. Then you can add a, even more randomness by uh, using a passphrase, and using those two components, you can generate a 512 bit seed. And that's the starting point for this hierarchical wallet. Okay. Okay, and here's another example. Uh, we won't go into the other example. So, um, okay, these are some Python, oh, a bunch of libraries that implement this uh, BIP39 uh, protocol, <coughs> which just tells you how to go from these, from this 128 uh, bits to your 512 bit seed. And there's also a implementation online um, where you can go to this link over here. I mean, we can go now if you guys want. Well, if Carlos wants, I guess. I don't know if you want Carlos. That's fine. That's we fine. Just keep, we can keep going. Okay, so now we've gone. Um, okay, so what have we done? Summarize one more time. Uh, you get some pseudo random number generator to get your entropy. From that, you get these uh, your mnemonic code words. So from the mnemonic code words, you get this 512 bit seed. And now you can put that in this uh, hash function. And uh, that outputs some 512 bit string. And you're gonna take the left 256 bits and you use that as your master private key. Uh, from the master private key, you can generate a master public key using standard. The Elliptic key cryptography, yeah. yeah. And then uh, from the right 256 bits, you create something called a master chain code. And this is gonna be useful when we wanna generate uh, uh, child keys right here, right? So you start with your 120 bits of entropy. I go through this, I'm going through this a bunch of times. You end with 512 bits. The left uh, 512 bits become a private key. The right five, uh, 256 bits become a chain code. Mm -hmm. And now you can generate uh, more private keys. And the way this works is you can take the parent public key, uh, the parent chain code, so the chain code that we just discussed, and some index number. You put that into a hash function. What's output is a 512 bit string. The left uh, 256 bits are added to the parent private key to give you a child private key. Mm. And the right 256 bits give you a child chain code. Mm -hmm. From the child private key, you can generate the public key with the standard procedure. And you can, re you can repeat this process as much as you want uh, to get grandchildren and great grandchildren and all this stuff. And By you can using, also change- You just like use the new chain code, right? To repeat the whole thing. Exactly. Yeah. And you can also do this with a new index number. So it gives the index gives you a sibling, I guess, and the chain code gives you uh, like a kid. <laughs> right. 
a child. So the, yeah, so the new indexes give you a sibling. So you can do the same process instead of using uh, zero, the index zero, you can use index one that gives you a sibling. And then you can use the child key as a parent key if you want mm -hmm. with the, chain, the child chain code as a parent chain code to create more uh, future generations. Beautiful tree so of life. This is, the, this is the tree structure for these uh, hierarchical wallets. Um, so I guess uh, we should say in order, like once you know your 24 words, your mnemonic, the rest is like done, you know? Like at that point, there's not, not you don't need to em enter anything else, right? Everything else gets derived from those first 12 words, right? Yeah, so like we discussed in the very beginning, right? So you start with the seed and the rest is just derived from the seed deterministically. That's yeah. why it's called a deterministic wallet. Very cool. So all you need to remember is in principle, your 12 words or your 24 words or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you can get the private keys for all other wallets generated from those words using this procedure. And it's an infinite number of possible wallets. Right. Just from, you can have an infinite number of child, ch children, right? Just by, okay, it goes yeah. up to 32 bits. But no, but you can have as, many, have as many children as you want. That's right. So you, you have, have a limit on the bits. children, on the siblings, I guess. Yeah. There's an, you can generate an infinite number of wallets from here. Yeah, exactly. And how many uh, sibling wallets? Two to the 32 sibling wallets for one. Yeah. Cool. Which is something. I don't know what that is. Um, Two to the power okay. of 32. Whoa. That's, that's a huge number. 4,294,000,000. Okay, so it's 4 so, billion. Yeah. So you might need more, but okay. You can, you can get more by getting children of the children. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, okay, so... Um, What's the point now? So the point is um, you can use, okay, imagine I wanted to uh, use this to do the example we talked about earlier, <coughs> where we put this on a website or a server and we want this to generate the, uh, the new private keys for us. You mean public keys? Uh, public oh. keys, sorry, yeah, without generating the private keys. Um, this is generating private keys, right? That's right, yeah. So. So it's a different process, I guess, if you want to just Actually, have private, key, private keys. Uh, yeah, they said it. Eh? Right. They, they say it, yeah. Two to 31. What? Uh, no, no. So, so it's just because they use two different derivations. So they use half of them for this specific derivation and the other half for the next thing we're going to talk about. Oh, okay, okay. So these are half the things you, 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 you calculated. Okay. So to recap, this uh, is the algorithm for generating child private keys from a seed. I guess public, yeah. public, private pairs, right? You guys, right. right? Yeah. Cool. So they, they discuss here, right? So you, you need uh, the parent chain code, the parent key and chain code can derive all of the children. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and then you need, you still need the, the child chain code to get all future generations. But also um, you can't go back up the tree, right? Um, That's right. So yeah not only can you not go back to, up the tree, if someone has the, the, the child private key, mm -hmm. but not the child chain code, say, mm -hmm. you can't go down, they can't go down the tree either. Yeah, correct. You, you need both. And you can't go to another sibling unless you have, I guess, the parent chain code, right? And, and, and in this case, uh, private and public keys. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, so you, I can give my brother a key and he'll never be able to get my key even though gen I, was gen I generated it from my, uh, from my mnemonic. That, that's, that depends on what you give him because there's something called an extended key, right? Over here. Oh. And an extended key is, is uh, it's a 512 bit string that contains the private key plus the chain code. Okay. So if you were to give your brother your, the, the child private key and the chain code, so this extended public key, he can derive mm -hmm. all the, the future generations. Okay, sure. Yeah. So you can give them one branch of your key if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, they, get, they go through an example here of... Uh, so I guess the point of having the extended private key is that it lets you continue deriving, right? Without, yeah, exactly. knowing, the, without exactly. knowing the root mnemonic, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it also lets you, like, whoever you give the extended key... Um, can only derive like 
lower uh, it's like future generations right they can't get they can't know the private key of the parent i guess right like if i give you if i generate an extended key and i give it to you yep you can't know like my uh previous generations right no because that goes through yeah. a hash right yeah yeah very that cool. goes through this hash mm -hmm. but i'll be able to spend your uh your keys that i give you right on, on that branch yeah yeah Okay, cool. But that's why there's a separate thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that, so okay, so I'll go through the paragraph where they discuss this. But the point is, um, okay. So like I said, extended keys are stored in 512-bit strings. So it's the it's the 256-bit key and the 256-bit chain code. So and there are two types of extended keys. There are extended private keys, which is what we just said. It's the private key plus a chain code. Mm -hmm. There's also extended public keys. Mm -hmm. Okay. And these are these can be the extended public keys can be used to create future public keys without knowing the private keys. Yeah. Okay. And that's what you reserve half of these indices for. Uh, these indices here from two to the two from zero to two to the thirty-two. Oh. And that's in the next figure. Oops. Um, which works like this. So instead now of uh, what you can also do is create child public keys from parent public keys without knowing anything about the private keys. So you start with a parent public key and the parent chain code and an index. You hash those things together and you, uh, the output is a 512 bit string. You take the left 256 bits and add that to the parent public key instead of the parent public key as above. And so that you gives you a that to the parent. You, I think you said public key twice. You add it to the public key instead of the parent private key, right? Parent private key, yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry. So here you, you add it to the parent public key and mm -hmm. you get a child public key. And the left or on the right 256 bits gives you the chain code. Mm -hmm. So now in this way, no private keys are available. So I can, I can input uh, an extended public key onto a server that server can generate all future generation public keys without knowing anything about the private keys. Mm -hmm. And I myself can generate by myself on the side using the other scheme here mm -hmm. where you add the private key, the parent private key. Oh man, sorry. You wait, you, you overshot it really hard. Yeah, I'm sorry. I can generate the private keys and spend all that Bitcoin. So the tree of private and public keys look the same, I guess, but you can traverse it either with the public or private key like method. So uh, you can create private keys using private keys. You yeah. can create child private keys using uh, parent private keys. Yeah. And use elliptic key cryptography to get the public key from the private keys. Yeah. But you can also uh, eliminate that step and just generate public keys by themselves. Yeah. But what if I wanted to spend uh, a generated public key? Yeah. So then you can, if you knew the parent private key, you can generate the child private key and spend. Yeah. But the point is you can give me the public key, the extended public key with the chain code. Mm -hmm. And then I can collect Bitcoin for you and never mm -hmm. be able to spend it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I guess I'm not seeing like how you can end up arriving at the private key if you're only generating using public keys. Right. Yeah, so uh, there's math involved here that's hidden behind the okay. behind the the words, right? But the public key here, this child public key, mm -hmm. is the same public key generated above, which is going to overshoot now because okay, yeah, is the same as this public key here, right? Generated from the private key using a different method, right? This arrow here means elliptic key cryptography, yeah, and these arrows mean this uh, like 512 bit. Hash, SHA 512. Mm -hmm. But this gives you a private key. And from the private key, you can generate the same public key that you could have generated using just the parent public key. Yeah, okay. So I guess you would need like a sequence of indices or something, right? To, to hit the, the public key that you want the private key for or something? Yeah, so the indices are given here, right? Yeah. So like, I mean, I'm just like, okay, I, I let you generate a bunch of public keys. Um, yep. And then they receive some Bitcoin. How do I end up arriving at the private key for them? That's my question. 
Oh, but you can enumerate all the you can enumerate all the indices, right? Very easily. There's two billion of them, say, right? Really? Okay. I mean, that just that seems a bit inefficient. But I guess you, you can just keep the index, right? That you generated, that you used to generate that specific wallet, and yeah, yeah. and then you can get all the all the future generations by yeah, just yeah. applying this procedure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think when you when you use your Trezor, you input your mnemonic words. Mm -hmm. It does all this stuff for you in the background. Mm -hmm. And what it remembers those are these indices. Yeah. And I think they talk about it a bit later, no? Like how that you can specify a key with like a path. Um, yeah. So, the, okay. Then, then there's like a procedure to yeah, organize yeah. your stuff. But okay. uh, this is the meat, I guess, of this chapter, right? So yeah, that's the, the whole point is that you can do the hierarchical wallets. You start from a seed and you can output a bunch of public, public keys and private keys. Yeah. And if I wanted to use a different device, a different Trezor or a different, uh, you know, uh, wallet application, I can mm. just input my words and the indices I want to refer to, and it would output all the, all the Bitcoin I can spend. Okay. Yeah. Just give me one sec. I'll be right back. I'm going to have to edit this. Okay. Sorry about that. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, hmm. I don't know how we how to start again, but um, <laughs> I think you were just recapping like this process, right, of public key generation. Yeah. Okay. So I guess uh, the recap. Well, the recap is you start from your uh, your 128 bits of random entropy. Get a mnemonic, generate a 512 bit seed. From that 512 bit seed, you can generate a bunch of private keys, a bunch of public keys um, that are all linked together. Mm -hmm. Okay, now uh, we mentioned that you can use this if you wanted to run a store, say, right? So here's using an extended public key on a web store, right? So you would input your extended public key, and then a bunch of public keys can be generated from that. Is there like a thing to show for that? Not really. No. But okay. But he, the problem with this, I'll just scroll back up to the, the figure. Oops. Because um, the chain code is not publicly available, right? So you have the parent chain code. If anyone uh, hacks any of the child public keys at any point in the chain, mm. 
they also have the chain code so they can get all the private keys for all future generations. Mm -hmm. Right. So th there's some danger here because you're, you're, you're exposing the chain code. You're exposing half the privacy or half the security to some third party. So maybe, um, to recap, like what's the setting here? Um, you have a online service. I have an online service yeah. and I want to collect money. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to use a different address for every transaction. Mm -hmm. All I have to do is input a parent public key mm -hmm. and a parent chain code. And then using this procedure, I can generate uh, as many public keys as I want. Yeah. That the, and, and then the only person that could spend the money going to those public keys is the person that controls the parent private key, which is okay, not publicly right, yeah. disclosed. Yeah. Right. The problem though is because I've exposed the parent chain code to a third party, if somehow that third party got access to any of the private keys, mm -hmm. any of the children private keys, they can generate all future generations, all the private keys of all the future generations using the chain code and that one private key. Yes, but they would not be able to go up the tree. No. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So, so there's a way to avoid this uh, pitfall, which is using this hardened, uh, what's it called? It's a... Is this the thing that Vitalik uh, discovered was a vulnerability? Maybe. I think it was. I guess it doesn't take like a, a genius to discover that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. But now you can use this different procedure. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they, they all look kind of similar. Um, Okay, so how does this work? Um, actually, I have to remember myself how this, how this works. Hardened uh, derivation of a child key omits the parent public key. Yes. Okay, so you just need to know the private key. Yeah, but that's the same as that's the same as before, right? Uh, so there's something I'm missing here. No, because it doesn't use the public key to generate um, new ones. No, well, that's the one we discussed the first time. The first one we discussed. Uh, oh, yeah, it's true. Yeah, this is exactly the same figure. I'm not sure if it's the same. That's why I'm... Oh, okay. No, it's a bit different. Okay. So previously, what was input into this uh, SHA-512 algorithm was the parent public key. Oh, really? So now you input the parent private key into this algorithm with mm. the parent chain code and the index number. And you add the parent private key to the left five, 256 bits mm -hmm. to get the child private key. Mm. So, uh, so again, okay, they, they discuss it here. So when, this, when the hardened private key function is used, the resulting child private key and chain code are completely different from what, you would, what would result from the normal derivation function. Mm -hmm. So the resulting branch of keys uh, can be used to produce extended public keys that are not vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So then you can, you can use this child public key, this child chain code, and use the algorithm, the previously described algorithm. But now every time you, the chain code is different for every uh, new uh, child, basically. Mm -hmm. So in this yeah. way, you, you can just kill off a branch, basically, mm -hmm. if, you, if you had to. Hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. That's cool. And this is exactly what these, uh, these, these uh, indices. So from, uh, so from one to two to the 31, you have all the indices uh, for the previous uh, derivation or previous mm -hmm. algorithm. And then the indices from 231 uh, to 232 to the mi minus one are for uh, these harden, this hardened derivation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. When would you want to not use the hardened one though? That's a good question. Um, uh, Maybe I, like, uh, I, 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 if I you guess want to the, delegate, no? I guess the point is you want to use hardened private if you want to reveal the, the extended public key, mm -hmm. you should use the hardened derivation, I guess. Yeah. 
if, you, if it's just for personal use where you don't have to give anyone an extended public key. Yeah, exactly. You can use your own private keys and, and you know, your, hard, your, your treasure is probably using the first 2 billion indices. Mm-hmm. But if you wanted to run your own web store, maybe you would use the, the second half. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess that's the point. Makes sense. Okay. And the last part of this is just like the, the convention for how to use the wallets, basically. Um, I don't know how important this is. Um, no, yeah, it's just for storing them, right? I it's, mean, just for, it's just for organizing your, your, your stuff if you want. Yeah. So what does is, what is M slash 23 slash 17 slash 0 slash 0 mean? It means the first child uh, public key from the first child of, of, of this uh, you know, so it's 17, like path, right? yeah, it just, it just tells you the past path up to the master seed, basically. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's so easier it's like going down. It's the first child of the first child of the 18th child of the 24th child of the master, you know? Got it. Very nice. Well done. Yeah. So what else is there? What is that in hex? No. Um, Why? What are those paths? Sorry, so this is something else. Um, this is like a tree structure. Okay, so this is, um, yeah, so if you look here, it says the third receiving address for Bitcoin payments in the primary account would be M, okay, uh, okay I guess I have to tell you what the pr- primary account is. Well, so they, t- they tell you how to use, how to, how to bid 44, specifies the structure as consisting of five predefined tree levels. So hmm. you have the master, then the purpose, the coin type. So you can use this for multiple, uh, you can use this for Litecoin as well if you want to say, right? Multiple Bitcoin style blockchains. Yeah, so Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, Dash, all this stuff, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The account, the change address, and the address index. So I think 44 yeah. maybe means Litecoin or something. So wait, the, the change address yeah. means like the ones where you dump the change? For a spending so, transaction, yeah. okay. Yeah, I think so. Hmm. So yeah, so forty. So uh, coin type, which is this guy here, means Litecoin. So it, it tells you here, right? This is the second private key in the Litecoin main account for signing transactions. Okay. So the, so there's some there's some proposed structure that you can use. But don't um. Coin. Don't Litecoin addresses have a different like generation rule? Yeah, yeah, but the, 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 you can use the same seeds to generate those, right? Ah, okay. There's still 256-bit seed uh, strings. Sure. They might start with a different number or something. Yeah. But you can always... Uh, the private key, I mean. Mm-hmm. But you can okay. always apply this. So that's the point. So I, I guess here it gives you, right? So uh, Bitcoin is M slash 44 slash zero. Bitcoin testnet is M44 slash one litecoin is they, they give you all the uh... mm-hmm. okay for now there are only three currencies defined bitcoin bitcoin test and litecoin mm-hmm. and the third level says it's the account allows users to subdivide their wallets into separate logical sub accounts yeah for accounting or organizational purposes man this is so nice yeah yeah so maybe we just uh, summarize for now so sure. the point is you can uh Instead of just having a list of a bunch of random keys that you just you just hold on to and try to remember or try to store in some file, you can use something like a Trezor or any other uh, wallet. That uh, and all you need to remember is a list of twelve or twenty-four words. And from those twelve or twenty-four words, you can generate an infinite number of wallets that are each secure, uh, or not not an infinite number of wallets, but an infinite number of public-private key pairs that are mm-hmm. each secure. And are only vulnerable if someone has access to your 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 seed words, your mnemonic words, basically. Yeah. And potentially a password. And it gives you like a nice natural way to organize things at the same time. That's right. Yeah. And all so you, yeah. Yeah. I guess yeah, like they say, you know, you you can have wallets for accounting, wallets for buying t-shirts, whatever, you know? Whatever you want, yeah. Um I guess the, the, the point is though, um, what's the point? So yeah, so you also have the ability to, um, so because the, the, because it's common practice, you wanna maintain your anonymity and privacy to use a different 
uh, address every time you spend Bitcoin or receive Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. This would mean that every time you spend Bitcoin, you'd have to generate a new private public key pair by yourself, right? Store it in some wallet and then like, uh, you know, send it to somebody and use that uh, to send you new, new, new Bitcoin. In this so way, guess, all, yeah, go on. In this way, all you have to do is remember these, these 12 or 24 or whatever number of words. I guess there's like a trade-off, right? Like you eliminate the, the vulnerability in terms of exposing one public key and compromising the rest of your keys by like making them be independent of each other. You can like derive one by knowing the, derive the rest by knowing one of them. But also you're kind of putting a lot of uh, pressure or a lot of importance on your mnemonics, right? But I, I think the, the difference, though, is that it, it's only a downward stream, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I mean, so if, the, if the mnemonic is never online, yeah, you should be safe, right? True. But I mean, whatever. I guess if you forget it or it gets lost somehow, you're screwed. I think they, they mentioned like it's super important uh, to, <laughs> I think they really focus on what happens if you die and you never store your mnemonic anywhere or your yeah. uh, salt. Um, so in that sense, like it's kind of a single point of failure in one way, even though um, it's, you know, very unlikely. It's, but, it's, so that is true. But I think, um, yeah, it is. So if someone physically hacks you, meaning if someone gets access to your physical device or like, or, mm -hmm. or, or your, or your, or can it be a piece of paper that you've been these on, then mm -hmm. you're screwed. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, you know, they can even, they can hack, for example, your Litecoin address, by hack, you mean guess a single public key, a private, private key private pair. Key. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so that's your, your safe, right? If someone guesses one of your private keys, they're not going to know the, the ones for the remaining uh, accounts. And, and they won't be and, able to know if they're related at all either. Right? Uh, yeah, not only that, you can also mm -hmm. give people access to an infinite number of public keys mm -hmm. without revealing any of the private keys to them. Yeah. So it's like, like you, you can be my collector, right? I give you a, a public key, say you receive on this one, and then I spend it. Yeah, so well, the example they give here is mm -hmm. you have a store, right? You mm -hmm. have an online store and you want to keep your public keys on a server to mm -hmm. collect money. But mm -hmm. obviously, you want to put your private keys there because someone hacks the server. Mm -hmm. Or if the server is being run on a third party, yeah. they would just spend all your money. In this way, you can, give, you can allow a different, trans, a different uh, address to be used for every transaction without revealing any of the private keys ever. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. And just another point, like, okay, so maybe we, I hope, hopefully this was understood, but the, the Bitcoin book there is very clearly written. So if anything <laughs> wasn't understood, you can, you can always refer to that. Of course you would say that. The one thing I was uh, a bit uh, annoyed by is that the, the math is not there, right? So it's not clear that these, um, it's not obvious, okay, not this guy, but it's not obvious that these two, this, this algorithm, the public the key public generated key from, one? Yeah. the public key generated from this algorithm corresponds mm -hmm. to the public key generated from the, the above algorithm, right? Yes, that, that's what was confusing me the most. Yeah, and I mean, it, I can understand how that's possible, but it's not. It, it's it's the mathematics behind this is very non-trivial, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least they feel like it. They ha they haven't actually demonstrated that it's possible. Maybe we should add that in. They're just stating that. Yeah, sure, maybe. Make it's probably very complicated. It's change. probably very complicated though. No, but it could just be a sentence, right? Like saying, once you've generated public keys with the public key algorithm, you can trace back like using your the secret key derivation to be able to spend those funds, right? Okay, I, I mean, I, I, I understand how, I think what I'm, what I'm saying is that I, what was annoying for me was that they're not actually, sh so in the rest of the book, they always show the math. Mm -hmm. They show the elliptic cryptography math, you know, they show the group theory and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Here they don't show you that this algorithm, like the public keys of this algorithm, there's mm -hmm. math that links it to the public key of the other algorithm. Okay, yeah. Like it's possible that the public key generated here is totally different, right? Mm -hmm. You're not guaranteed that, well, I mean, mm -hmm. I guess you are guaranteed somehow because... Yeah, it's just not explicit. Yeah. I mean, okay, yeah, I agree. The Maybe it's worth saying that there's probably some benefit to having like a fully random wallet as well now. I mean, 
that way if you if you're you know you forget one of your mnemonics you're fine you still have the rest right you don't compromise your entire yeah i guess you, you would want a, a deterministic like a bunch of deterministic laws I guess. yeah that's it yeah um yeah the point is, if you if you get if one if you lose the mnemonic for any of the wallets, you lose all the money. They're not they're not like cross. Or maybe you want to do a two or three signature or something, mm -hmm. using uh, multiple wallets. Yeah. I mean, there's something to having fully independent wallets as well, right? So yeah, I guess if you, if you're gonna keep a bunch of Bitcoin somewhere and store it for a very long time. Mm -hmm. You, I guess in principle, you can use a bunch of random keys. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to constantly spend and use a different address for every different transaction, yeah, the process, I think, is just too annoying, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you have a web store or you have some kind of... If you're accepting money daily or spending money daily, your device, I guess, would have to keep track of everything you've generated. If only anybody would spend Bitcoin daily. Yeah. If only we're ready for it. It's all there. Someone please use it. Yeah, it, it is crazy that people, it's crazy that people thought about this preemptively, you know? Super preemptively. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how uh, PayPal and stuff like that works, you know, like they, but this seems like very nicely prepared for this kind of thing. Yeah. But I guess PayPal is easier, right? Because there's just a central person moving the money, you know? For sure. Yeah. Man, I think my microphone's making a bunch of weird noises. Yeah, I think it is also. Do you hear them? Yeah, I hear them. But it's like a robot sound. Yeah. That's super weird. Maybe it's my pop filter. <laughs> There's a resonance frequency. Anyways, I guess that's what, that's what we prepared for you today. Thank you, Perry. I think we've gone a bit over time, but that's fine. That was fun. No, no, no. Our average, our, our new target is like 120, 130. Okay, so we've got under time. Yeah, yeah, we've got plenty of time. Okay, so uh, hopefully the week after this is released, we'll go back to applications. Yeah. Uh, I sorry. barely hear you now. Yeah, I unplugged my mic. Because it was being weird. Okay, now okay. should be. Um, yeah, so I'll, uh, we're probably going to release, I think by the time this is out, the one with uh, Jacob will already be out. Yeah. So we're kind of ahead of the game here. Nice. <laughs> cool. All right, well, that was pretty nice. Um, thanks, Perry. Yeah. See you um, next week. See you next time. Yeah. All right. Ciao. See you later. Um.